altitude as well. Can you tell me? The next morning, I sought medical advice from Dr. Rinzing Namgyal. Far from the advanced and certainly fatal altitude sickness I'd imagined, Rinzing diagnosed a minor cold. Yeah. I'm sort of surprised he's saying it's a light cold because as far as I'm concerned it's a pretty heavy cold. <laughs> the cure was a wrap of herbal tea and there was no excuse to go down. We pressed on. Daniel had arranged to join the pastoral nomads at the time of their move to summer pastures. Given the sparsity of the vegetation, I was astonished to see huge herds of wild donkeys and smaller bands of antelopes. It's very barren. It's not desert yet. Alpine steppe. And this is as high as people live, isn't it? I mean... Basically. A couple hundred meters higher, maybe. Here we are on four, nine, I guess, right now. Yeah. Yeah, so. At f five, three, five, four, there's no more vegetation runs out, so really nothing to feed anything anymore. My dear, it's <laughs> not, not a lot of vegetation here, is there? I simply couldn't understand how these people survived in this vast brown wilderness. So when Nudrup invited me to stay for a day or two, I quickly accepted. Nick. Nick, how do you do? Pleasantries over with, we wasted no time in getting on the move. The tent, is that? It's heavy. Very heavy. What do they actually sleep in? Um, mostly their coats. Yeah. That's the sleeping bags. And a couple of carpets maybe down below. Or sheepskins. Have we asked if they've got enough for us? Because we'll freeze to death in this stuff. <laughs> The agenda was to unite Nudrup's sheep with his yak herd. They had moved to the summer pastures a week before and were being tended by Lamo, his neighbour. It was the best part of a day's walk away. After eight kilometers, I could discern little change in the vegetation. And six kilometers on, when we'd arrived, I was still puzzled. Perhaps it was down to my untrained eye, but I couldn't spot a single difference between a winter and a summer pasture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But the accommodation was certainly different. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you Thank you very much. Unlike the solid winter quarters, the summer residences are tents, manufactured from yak hair. Perhaps because they're for summer use only, they're anything but airtight. And when I came to bed down in the men's quarters, I started to worry about whether my synthetic fleece would cope with the nighttime temperatures, which could drop to as low as minus 15. He's putting two on. My anxiety only increased when Nudrup cocooned himself in not one, but two huge sheepskin coats. And he disappears. But the, the, the secret ingredient is, is this, isn't it? Any chance of, um, you know... <laughs> Nudrup somehow sensed I was feeling a bit chilly, and he generously gave up one of his fleeces. Thank you very much. I'm all right, Daniel. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'll see what else is here. There's another one. Gosh, they're heavy, too. Really heavy. The next day, I set about trying to work out how it is that these people managed to scrape an existence from this remorseless barren plain. From the moment the animals were released from the pens to graze on the surrounding hills, 
it became clear that nothing is left to waste. This one? Ah. No? Too wet. The first chore of the day was to bag up the overnight dung. It's quite a tricky business, actually. There are no trees at this altitude, as there is neither sufficient oxygen in the air nor moisture in the ground to support anything more than the thin and sparse carpet of grass. You've got to get your eye in. Dung is the only combustible fuel on the plateau. <laughs> the mainstay of the nomad's livelihood is the yak. First domesticated 3,000 years ago, this is the bovine maestro of high-altitude survival. Actually, I'll tell you what, just going up that gentle slope was exhausting. I wish we had yak blood. They yeah. have three times the amount of blood cells than yeah. ordinary cows. That would be nicer too, yeah. <laughs> Not only does the yak have supercharged haemoglobin, it has also evolved a huge windpipe, lungs and heart to further maximise the take-up and distribution of oxygen. It is not for nothing that the Tibetans refer to these beasts as the treasure of the plateau. They are beasts of burden, they provide two different types of hair for cloth and tent making, they're meat to sustain the dropka through the winter, they can be traded for grain and other essentials not available on the plateau, and finally they daily give fresh milk. But it's not just yaks. <laughs> Even she gets out of breath. <laughs> yeah. Lamo needed a seasoned sheep's stomach to process the yak milk into the ubiquitous yak butter. They were utterly dependent on their animals. So each night, the small and the vulnerable were sorted into strange mud ovens to keep them warm and safe from predators. Though the principles which determined who went where somewhat eluded me. Okay. There you go. What? There you go. That one there, and that one. In that. In that. In that one, okay. Whites, blacks. Can't be boys, girls, because there's three of them. Sleep time. It's good to be out of the wind. As I sat down for my final meal with Nudrup and his men, I realized that life here is a stark equation. No animals equals no people. This has got to be the very edge of our student existence. It looks like an old sheep to me, is it? It was. Yeah. yeah. Everything so finely tuned, every aspect of their animals is used. The old bit of carcass for the bellows, the dung in the fire. I mean, without animal dung to burn, they'd be really stuck, wouldn't they? Because there's nothing else to burn. Nothing. The hides for their coats, the hair for the tent, every aspect. And yet, there's so little pasture. <laughs> Many thanks. <laughs> Hopefully, well, not even dry, I don't <laughs> <laughs> That was a big bite. <laughs> The following morning, as the slow cycle of daily dropka life began again, I was getting ready for the off. If animals had helped Tibetans at these altitudes for thousands of years, I realized that they could help me in my bid to conquer Kailash over five days. Ah. Oh, no. okay, it's not bad. Well, it's the business. <laughs> ah. That's better. The real yeah. thing, that's warmer too. Having agreed a fair price, the coat was on, and I was as ready as I was ever going to be. <laughs> good? <coughs> yeah, good. It was mid-April, but at four and a half kilometers above sea level, the plateau was still in winter. I'd left Daniel and the Dropka two days before, and we'd seen almost no one since. With only a hundred kilometers to go until Kailash, I came across an oasis of life as surreal as any I've seen. What I first thought was ice turned out not to be. 
this was more evidence of just how violent the tectonic upheaval was and is. This crust on top of the world was sea salt. This used to be the seabed. I mean, we're now 4,445 metres, four and a half kilometres above sea level. And uh, the sea's come up to meet me, as it were, over a few million years, of course. And intense solar radiation uh, evaporating off all the water, leaving you with this superb white, salty surface. How much does a guy like this get paid each day, do you know? Just to 10 yuan each day, I think. 10 yuan a day? <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's not much, is it? <laughs> Blimey. I've rarely encountered a harsher, more medieval scene. Merely existing on this plateau is so difficult that these people migrate to the salt pan to work for a wage packet of just 30 pence a day. We crossed the Mayom La Pass and headed on up towards Mount Kailash. Regarded as the Axis Mundi, or heart of the world by Buddhists, Hindus and Jains, pilgrims walk around this sacred peak in the hope of expiating the sins of this life, gaining religious merit and earning reincarnation as a human being. Each year, Mount Kailash lures thousands of pilgrims to its slopes. But when I reached Da Chen, the pilgrimage base camp, I very much got the impression that I was ahead of the crowd. It's all very quiet, isn't it? Yes. The season is in very early now. Early in the season, huh? Yeah. It was here that I'd arranged to meet my companion for the yeah. pilgrimage, uh, Norbu Wangtang. The first of the season. The good season is about to one month away. Is it? Yeah. So you reckon we're the first of the year? Sure. I think it's the... There you are. It was a bit of a ghost town, but they were obviously gearing up for the pilgrimage season because we managed to find all we needed for our three-day trek. The staple in the form of tsampa, or ground barley, protein in the form of dried yak, How much dung do you think we'll need, Nobby? and fuel in the familiar form of yak dung. Well, we're more or less ready now. We ran into a slight problem this morning when we talked to the yak herder the guy that we're going to hire the axe off, um, which is that there's a, a pass up there, the highest part around Kailash, could be snowed in. No one seems to know because no one's been up there recently. I mean, we are the first pilgrims here. But if this pass is snowed in, then the axe won't be able to get past, which means either we come back or carry on on foot, I suppose. Yes, uh, yeah. they carry we could carry what we can we can carry now it seemed that norbu and i were fairly well matched for the ordeal ahead in physical terms but beyond playing at home he had a further advantage over me as a lifelong practicing buddhist he had faith the afternoon before leaving he insisted we visit tenzing wangdak darchen's reincarnation lama Gosh, you have to be very fit to be a monkey. Oh. Yeah. His main piece of advice was to shut out all material thoughts and focus on the self. Mm. Your family, your car, and your office is not important. It's, it's your family? No, no use.